On behalf of my co-leader, Barbara Burtness and I, I'm pleased to introduce Bill Jorgensen, one of our developmental therapeutic program members and also my long-term collaborator. Bill is a graduate of Princeton and Harvard, spent 15 years on the faculty at Purdue, and in 1990, he moved to Yale, where he's currently Sterling Professor in the Chemistry Department. Bill is internationally recognized as one of the world leaders in computational chemistry and drug design. His research has been recognized by many honors, and among, among those include the American Chemical Society COPE Scholar Award, the ACS Award for Computers in Chemical and Pharmaceutical Research, the ACS Hildebrand Award, the ISQBP Award in Computational Biology, the Sato International Award from the Pharmaceutical Society of Japan. He's been elected to membership in the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the US National Academy of Sciences. Another recent honor in 2020 includes one of the 16 researchers selected uh, for a Nobel laureate citation for individuals considered doing Nobel, cl Nobel class research that has been cited over 2000 times. Today, um, he's going to tell you a little bit about some of his work on SARS-CoV-2. So without further ado, Bill, take it away. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Karen, and a pleasure to be here, the other side of the campus. So the our work I'll tell you about today is uh, totally a collaboration between my research group and chemistry and Karen's group over here in the, the med school. So uh, I'll talk a little bit in general about computer-aided drug discovery and then specifically about our work in uh, finding very potent uh, protease inhibitors for <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2. So a key element of uh, drug design is the fact of trying to make inhibitors uh, that bind to an enzyme typically. So, and we'll be talking about again, a small molecule binding to SARS-CoV-2 protease. And so this is governed by an equilibrium where you have the protein in water, the uh, inhibitor in water, there's a free energy of binding, and then the complex so the free energy of binding, the G, because we're working in the constant pressure, constant temperature world is uh, for Gibbs. So it's a Gibbs free energy. And I put the stamp of our former colleague, uh, J. Willard Gibbs here is the uh, father of thermodynamics. So the free energy of binding, just to introduce the concept of a nanomolar inhibitor. So the free energy of binding is uh, given by minus RT ln the dissociation constant. If you have a dissociation constant of 10 to the minus nine molar, that would correspond to a one nanomolar inhibitor or so an inhibitor that has that KD. Uh, one that has a KD of 10 to the minus six would be a micromolar inhibitor and or binder. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, most drugs turn out to be typically one to, let's say 20 or so nanomolar uh, in a binding assay. And this all ultimately has to do with the pharm human pharmacology and uh, just how big a pill uh, one is willing to take. So this obsession with nanomolar inhibitors just uh, you know, reflects uh, this fact. <laughs> So uh, ultimately here, we're gonna to have to do simulations and computer simulations of proteins binding to ligands in water. And so how did this arise? When did it, will such things happen? And uh, the answer is there really wasn't any uh, significant work on doing computer simulations of molecular fluids before the late 1970s. And then of course it grew slowly after that. The problem is you have a lot of particles you're using classical force fields to describe the interactions, but there's still a lot of particles and you have to uh, observe the system over a significant time period. So if you're doing molecular dynamics, you might wanna run the molecular dynamics for uh, picosecond, hundreds of picoseconds, nanoseconds. And uh, this just, we didn't have the computer resources to do that. Um, and then making it more complicated by putting a protein into it and describing the energetics of the protein 
and uh, uh, the water. That really didn't happen until uh, mid 1980s. And my colleague here, Julian Torado Rivas, and I published one of the first uh, calculations uh, for a protein in water where we did molecular dynamics for 100 picoseconds. And that was in uh, 1988. <clears throat> so doing the type of calculations we're talking about today is a relatively uh, recent phenomenon. Uh, this is a picture, we'll talk about HIV reverse transcriptase. And just to get the sense, I usually give this to less sophisticated audiences to point out the yellow, little yellow piece is the inhibitor, and that's enough to shut down uh, this enzyme. And this is an example of one of the compounds that are developed through Karen's and, and our work that is a uh, inhibitor of HIVRT, that little molecule. So here's the way we do it. Uh, we normally start with an X-ray structure. And the first phase of this, we're looking for micromolar hit compounds that then we have to do a lot of hard work on to bring them to the low nanomolar uh, level. So we normally start with an X-ray structure, and this can be from you know, somebody else's work and we remove the ligand that might be in that X-ray structure, and then we try to design our new, our own uh, inhibitors. And that, to start out, we do a virtual screening, uh, which is docking, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, where we literally fly molecules into the protein structure and see which ones look the best. Or we do de novo design, where we use a growing program uh, that I wrote a while back that uh, starts with a little seed core of a molecule, let's say benzene that you place on the binding site. And then the program will build libraries of compounds starting from that core, growing them out in the binding site. And then you have to uh, uh, score them, evaluate them in the same manner. Now this uh, invariably gives us these micromolar hit compounds. Uh, we've never been fortunate enough to do this uh, initial part of the work and end up with nanomolar inhibitors. Uh, we're close, you know, single digit uh, micromolar. Uh, so then the hard part is the lead optimization because we're going to have to refine the uh, micromolar hits by making small changes. Uh, we decide what to do by a lot of structure building and energy minimizations. Uh, so this bomb program of mine, it can rapidly build protein ligand complexes. We can energy minimize them. That's just a fast calculation compared to adding the water doing the molecular dynamics. So we do a lot of the structure building energy minimization. And then for select cases, we will do, excuse me, the free energy calculations that are sort of our hallmark. We call them FEP, free energy perturbation calculations. Virtually all pharmaceutical companies today are, you know, you know, jumped on this. Everybody's doing FEP calculations for uh, drug design. So then you have to make a decision on what molecules to synthesize. Uh, they're assayed, so you need somebody like Karen to help out on the assaying and the crystallography. Um, the crystallography isn't uh, critical, but it sure is helpful. Um, it you know very much helps reinforce what the modeling is doing. And also sometimes you'll see that the, 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 there's a change in the protein structure from what you originally started with that you will see in the crystallography. Uh, you don't necessarily see it in the computation. So the crystallography is really helpful. Um, in the HIV area, Karen and I <laughs> got along for quite a few years without uh, crystal structures. Uh, but then once we started, Karen's lab started getting them, it certainly made life a lot more confident. So you repeat this cycle until you uh, get the uh, potency you want. Uh, all the while we are mindful of properties. So we want the compounds to be drug-like. And that requires uh, having things like reasonable solubility, reasonable cell permeability, no reactive functional groups. So we have software that checks that. And then we also do some measurements of solubility and cell permeability. Okay, so uh, the FEP calculations 
are done for where you do molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations for protein, ligand, and a, typically a ball of several thousand water molecules. And you do a calculation where you're comparing the green ligand, green inhibitor with the blue. So you do a calculation where you have protein, green ligand to give complex, protein, blue ligand to give complex. And what we do in the computer, it turns out to be easier is to mutate the green ligand to the blue unbound in water and then bound the protein. And the difference in the two uh, vertical numbers there then gives us the difference in predicted free energy of binding. Um, and so this type of calculation uh, wasn't done at all before 1985, or just the simple uh, green to blue in water uh, FEP calculation. That was something that I uh, uh, will take credit for doing the first uh, calculation of that type. Again, then there's no software. You had to write all the software, you know, the force fields we had to develop, et cetera. So it was a very different world in 1985. Okay, so here just a little bit on HIV. Uh, HIV is still a big problem. Some of the statistics which are shown there for 2021, there are you know, close to 40 million people in the world that are uh, infected with HIV. About one to two million each year are, are becoming infected. And uh, they're on the order of 650,000 uh, deaths. Uh, so that's down quite a bit from what it was, but it's still, you know, a very serious problem. And uh, long story short, uh, we have worked on, with Karen, on the uh, reverse transcriptase. And the, uh, so this is a, uh, an RNA uh, virus, and it has a reverse transcriptase, uh, which converts the RNA to DNA, which is incorporated into the host cell's a genome by HIV integrase. So uh, HIV reverse transcriptase has been the principal target for anti-HIV drugs, and there are two classes, the nucleosides and the non-nucleosides. Uh, Karen has worked on both. Uh, in our collaboration with Karen, we've only worked on non-nucleosides, uh, the NNRTIs, and they're allosteric inhibitors. They bind in this little pocket uh, that is about 10 angstroms or so from the polymerase active site. It's one of the few examples of, of uh, allosteric inhibitor that's, that have become drugs. It's very, very, very uh, I'm, I'm I'm have to think a bit to find others. This is the principal example. Uh, the crystal structure, again, a Yale connection, the original crystal structure of HIVRT was done in the Stites lab, 1992. This was a very big, uh, uh, you know, discovery at the time because the HIV crisis was so uh, severe. And it's a big protein, a thousand uh, residues. So uh, long story short, we've tried to make better non-nucleoside inhibitors. The original ones have limitations. They're susceptible to mutations that arise quickly. They also had some undesirable pharmacology. So uh, the way we proceed on HIV is the same with the uh, COVID. And uh, the trick in uh, lead optimization is making systematic changes, small changes in uh, substituents on rings, the rings themselves and groups that link uh, rings together. And if you know the right changes to make, uh, they can have profound effects. So this is an early uh, HIV compound of, uh, of ours that we uh, came about from a de novo design. And in Karen's lab, the assay they're running is an infected T-cell assay. And this compound had an EC50 for uh, inhibiting the reproduction of, of, of the HIV in the infected uh, cells of 10 micromolars, so 10,000 nanomolar. So that's a reasonable starting place, a small molecule, but we've got to increase the potency by a thousand fold. So I, I point out here that if you happen to know to put a cyano group in the four position of this ring, you get a very big boost, a 50 fold boost to 200 nanomolar. Okay. Then if you happen to change the thiazole into a, a pyrimidine, 
you get another tenfold boost and you're at 17 nanomole. So uh, quite amazing. And then if you happen to know to put a methoxy group in the th three position of the pyrimidine ring, you're at two nanomolar. So you have more potency than you need for a drug. So this is all fine. And this is what we use the FEP calculations to help us with because these changes are in a sea of possible changes. So we do, however, scans where we have, if we have a compound like this, we'll scan in chlorine atoms at each open site to see if we can uh, add a little uh, beef to it. And that might have, if we did that, it would show that this uh, four position is good for chlorine. Well, if it's good for chlorine, it may also be good or even better for cyano because they're both somewhat electron withdrawing. So then we would try cyano. Uh, but we do these initial scans. We also do heterocycle scans of five and six membered rings uh, because they are obviously affect hydrogen bonding patterns. And hopefully that would have picked up that the pyrimidine was the way to go. And then finally, we do another substituent scan on the pyrimidine of methyls and chlorines. We would see that substitution in the three position is a good thing. And before long, we would come to the methoxy. So that's the way it's done. And that's a two nanomole or a very potent compound. Uh, we did in collaboration with Eddie Arnold get a crystal structure of that uh, quite, a, quite a bit later. And that was the only crystal structure we had until Heron's group started getting some around 2012. Okay, so here is just some of the work with Karen. These are all uh, publications on different uh, NNRTIs. And uh, you might say, well, gee, in 2006, you had this two nanomolar compound, aren't you done? Why are you, why are you keeping doing this? And the answer is the, that number is against the wild type virus. But the virus, as you know, it mutates just like COVID is uh, mutating. And there's a whole panel of mutants with uh, HIV and you need to have efficacy against all of the uh, common mutants with one compound. So it's tough. So that initial compound, like initial uh, uh, compounds in this class, such as uh, nevirapine was the first approved drug in this class, like nevirapine, it was good against wild type, but not, not much else. So these other compounds, uh, I'll just skip to this one, one of our better compounds, we've increased the potency, but we very much increased the uh, performance, again, mutant panels. So a very difficult mutant is a double mutant, K103N, Y181C. And this compound here is a 10 nanomolar EC50, which is you know, good and great against that. Whereas the original compounds here would have had no uh, efficacy against that uh, mutant. And we've gone on, we even see something that looks like a covalent inhibitor, which it is. We, uh, with cooperation with Karen, we have, uh, covalent inhibitors for HIV uh, RT wild type and also the Y181C uh, mutant. But I will uh, go on now to uh, what we did with COVID. So fortunately, uh, because of our work on HIV, we we're pretty well positioned to, to uh, try to do something when COVID rolled around at the beginning of 2020. So this is the, uh, uh, again, an RNA genome, uh, and it, some of the proteins that it encodes are indicated here, and not as many as with uh, HIV, uh, but you do have um, the, uh, the, there's the proteases here, uh, sort of papain-like protease, and then the main protease. And what we've worked on is the main protease. Uh, there's also, you've probably heard of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is just to reproduce the RNA uh, genome. That's another possible target. And some of the structural proteins are over here. There's the spike, the famous spike that is uh, mutating and causing a lot of problems for the vaccines. So the uh, cycle, the life cycle, involves the uh, COVID uh, virus binding to the ACE2 uh, receptors on the cells, endocytosis. Uh, the RNA genome is then processed by a host uh, 
ribosomes to give you these two polyproteins, a similar situation with uh, HIV uh, generating uh, polyproteins that have to be cleaved by HIV protease. So here's where if we can stop this proteolysis step, the rest of the uh, reproduction cycle stops. And it's, uh, there, like I said, there aren't as many targets here as with uh, HIV, there's no integrase, no reverse transcriptase. And so what we picked in the beginning of 2020 uh, that we would work on the protease uh, almost because there's hardly anything else to work on. And there was a crystal structure uh, reported. So uh, the first thing we did, so this came about, uh, if, as you recall, things got serious in late January, 2020. And then in March, 2020 is when things shut down. So we were um, uh, sent out of the lab, you know, we could work from home. Um, if you had special permission, you could work in the lab, but we didn't uh, pursue that. But we decided for working at home that what we could do is we would do docking because we have the crystal structure, a crystal structure of the protease. So we would do docking. And the typical way docking works is you have the crystal structure and you have a library of compounds. And these are typically commercially available compounds. There's a famous library called zinc that has up to a hundred million compounds. And then the computer software combines them and it makes the complexes. And then it has to score the complexes, which is the weak spot. Often the scoring isn't very accurate, but you can then test the high scoring molecules. Well, that's a lot of compounds to deal with. So um, I thought what we would do first instead is to dock known dr drugs, uh, approved FDA approved drugs. So I happen to keep a library of these in the computer and there are three dimensional structures of the drugs, which is, this is all three dimensional. And so I asked uh, Mohammed and Julia uh, to uh, dock the uh, uh, 2000 known uh, drugs to see if we could see get some reasonable uh, hits uh, from that and so what happened was uh, the docking was done in a consensus fashion meaning they used four different docking protocols three different programs and four ways of doing the docking because any one program we don't fully trust so we're hoping that there'll be a consensus where you score well in all four uh, uh, protocols and so we uh, got the list, <laughs> excuse me. I don't have COVID, I've tested. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we, we got the list of the top compounds. And then very importantly, we visualized the predicted poses, the complexes. And uh, based on that visualization, we picked compounds that we think look good in the way they're positioned. And uh, I also was very concerned about the idea that we would possibly be making analogs of these compounds, because uh, I didn't expect to have, again, come up with a 10 nanomolar compound we never have in the past. So we purchased 17 compounds and um, gave them to Karen's lab. And Karen had meanwhile obtained the protein, expressed it, and she also had implemented the, uh, a FRET assay that was from the literature. So she was ready to go. And uh, the 17 compounds arrived. And uh, to our surprise in Karen's lab, 14 of them showed some inhibition of the protease activity of uh, a SARS-CoV-2 protease. So that was uh, shocking. And so we did very well on the compound selection. And the most potent compounds are listed here. They were uh, single digit uh, micromolar. And, but we had a bunch that were under about 50 uh, micromolar. So uh, that, this we published, and this is a picture of one of the dock structures. The binding site is, you know, is meant to accommodate a peptide that's gonna get cleaved. And we have sites, subsites, we call S1, S1 prime, S2, and then this channel, S3, S4, S5. So here's just a picture of a compound uh, 
in that uh, binding site. So we published that, but of course we were looking very much now at one of these compounds we're gonna take and try to optimize it. And uh, the compound we picked, we, were, we didn't say what it was gonna be in this paper, and it was not one of the most potent ones. In fact, it was this one, parampenyl, um, which is only 100 to 250 micromolar, so a relatively weak uh, hit. But uh, the fact was I liked the way it looked. Um, and this was the dock structure. Uh, I'm orienting them all in the same way, S1, S prime, S2. And I felt that the dock structure looked reasonable. Sometimes they, they have features that you just say, this doesn't feel right, but this looked reasonable. But I could also see that it had features that were not optimal. So looking at it over here, so the yellows are carbons, reds are oxygens, blues are nitrogens. Um, I could see features that were not optimal. There's a histidine here, and it could it would be nice if it could form a hydrogen bond with this ring. So we probably want to put a nitrogen in here. This nitrogen or the pyridine, that's not doing any good. So we can get rid of that. Um, it's just facing out into solvent. There's an NH over here that would like to be in a hydrogen bond, but it isn't. Meanwhile, this carbonyl is just uh, interacting with solvent. So maybe I could flip that from the, over left to there. Plus it looked like there was a little space uh, in the uh, meta position of that right ring. So um, what happened next was we did some FEP calculations uh, to test those ideas. And this is what the sort of raw data looks like in an Excel sheet. So the, the, the things I'm trying here are for the uh, left ring, I'm gonna try different rings. So a ring scan where I did two, three, four uh, pyridinyl, four pyrimidine, two triazine. So a bunch of different rings there. I also did a calc, and that those calculations said that the three pyridine, the, the negative number here is good. This is the change in free energy of binding relative to benzene. Uh, so this was saying, go for the three pyridine. Uh, also, I checked that ring flip of the carbonyl, and that was very good, minus 4.7. And uh, then over on the right side, uh, checking to see if we could put something in that meta position. Indeed, uh, the meta position, when we did a chlorine scan at each position, the meta here uh, shed very good. Looks like we should put a chlorine there. So combining those three ideas led to uh, then the three initial compounds that were synthesized. So here now I'm aligning everything so you can see the changes from parampenyl. Um, the three pyridyl, the carbonyl has been flipped and we've added the chlorine and we've left the, the cyanophenyl from parampenyl. Uh, I also, from modeling with my BOMB program, uh, again, the, the slow part in all of this is synthesis. So uh, we have plenty of time to do computer work while people are doing synthesis. So uh, it's a natural thing to you know, look very hard at these structures. And I had looked hard at this and I recognized maybe I could do something over with this ring because there's an edge it will show more clearly here of a loop that uh, could use some hydrogen bonds. And I thought a uracil might work. So I modeled that with the program complexes looked very good. So we synthesized a uracil and also just this uh, three, five dichloro compound. So this was a very happy day now uh, because the potency of those original three compounds was 10, six and four micromolar. So here we've gotten a huge boost as expected from the FEP calculations. And this was uh, wonderful. And I'll, I'll tell you the timing more in a bit, but this is now uh, uh, June of uh, 2020. So we didn't get back into our lab until uh, May, uh, May. And now in June, we have these this four micromolar compound. We've only, and, and <clears throat> it came a little later, it was actually October and Karen's group got a crystal structure uh, for that, uh, 
dichloro compound. And it's basically identical to what we'd predicted. There's the carbonyl and H hydrogen bond we wanted. There's the hydrogen bond between the pyridine and the histidine. We still have the nitrile hydrogen bonded in what you call the oxy anion sort of hole. And the uh, dichloro compound is again, looking very good. Furthermore, we have this channel running north from the upper chlorine there. And so we're ready to think about putting some of something in that channel. So uh, the next thing was to try to grow substituents into that channel. And just for grins, uh, and I mean, really not interested in methyl particularly, but just for grins, uh, we did FEP calculations for methyl ethyl propyl, O methyl O ethyl O propyl, O butyl, and then some ones with a hydroxyl that I figured probably wouldn't be very good. Problem with hydroxyl is it's very happy unbound. So the water's around it. And if you go bound, it may be happy again, but you're not gonna gain much. Uh, the way you gain is by having more hydrophobic pieces that are binding into hydrophobic part of the uh, binding site. So this told us, uh, try the O-propyl compound. So we synthesize those, and there are two synthetic chemists are working on this, uh, Lizzie and uh, Chun Wei. And so uh, we they made uh, the propoxy compound in both the cyanophenyl and the uh, urea series. And uh, this turned out great, 140 nanomolar and 120 nanomolar. Later on, this wasn't in sequence, we had made the trifluoromethyl analogs of that. They're more hydrophobic. They're probably gonna uh, be better binders as they were showing this one even down at 25 nanomolar. Uh, but generally, I don't like CF3 groups in uh, drug-like molecules because they really hurt the solubility of the compounds. So, but we're uh, doing very well here, 120 nanomolar. And I'll show you the timing on this, but this, this I think, is in August uh, now. And uh, uh, Karen's group, again, got a crystal structure in October. And uh, it was exactly as I expected, including this bent Part at the at the end of the propoxy group. And so it's a gauche, we call it a gauche. You've all taken organic chemistry, I'm sure. And so uh, it's the course you hated the most, but uh, maybe, maybe not. But there it is, there's this gauche OCCC. And uh, we had figured that was the case. The modeling told us that because it, that terminal methyl fits right in the S4 uh, site of the uh, of that channel, and so there's a leucine or proline. It's a hydrophobic uh, site, and so put it right in there. Uh, also, again, like I said, there's lots of time to do computing. Uh, so we considered uh, benzyl oxy groups. So you can imagine a benzene ring sitting here, and potentially projecting. Uh, a substituent into that pocket. So sure enough, uh, we did modeling on these benzyl oxy analogs and did a chlorine scan on the phenyl, which said and a methyl scan, and both methyl and chlorine were predicted to be very good. And so those compounds were made and uh, uh, the parent compounds, 120 micromolar, but the orthochloro compound, 18 uh, nanomolar compound. And this we had in uh, uh, October of, uh, of uh, 2020. And Karen's group uh, again got a crystal structure for the, uh, ben the parent benzyl oxy components and it's ex positioned as one expected. So this is just now a little video to have a break. This, uh, this is a dimer. So there are two, this is uh, Karen's crystal structure of the propoxy compound and uh, just zeroing in on it there. Okay, so you can just run it again. So that little molecule is enough to shut down 
the enzymatic activity of that protein. Okay, so this we published, and uh, as I'll say in a, a second here, we're going to, of course, the, what I've shown you so far is just protease inhibition. We've got to go into cells, infected cells. And so the, we published uh, 28 compounds. Uh, of course, one of the results I've talked to you about so far, and we have lots of compounds here under uh, 50 uh, nanomolar. And you can see there are authors, lots of people involved. And from the medical school, you know, Farron Isaacs and Brett Lindenbach's group are very important, along with Karen, in doing uh, the uh, cell assays that we'll describe in a, Miller in a minute. And Scott Miller in chemistry had uh, donated his graduate student, Lizzie Stone, to help us with the synthesis, along with my postdoc, Chun Wei Zhang. Uh, so that was good. We published that in ACS Central Science in February 2022. A little later, we also replaced the benzyl oxy with heterocycles. This is a uh, standard, I'd say, medicinal chemistry. This isn't uh, you know, genius stuff. Uh, heterocycles often have some in, uh, desirable properties over a substituted benzene. So we published some more compounds in the uh, summer then of uh, 2021. Uh, we also uh, tested cell permeability with a PAMPA assay in our lab and measured aqueous solubility. So now we have uracils with a hydrogen or with a methyl. So the ones with the methyl are going to have better um, uh, cell permeability. And so that is an issue because we want to show that we have uh, efficacy in a cell assay. So this is uh, where the, again, the folks here in the med school are so important to us. Uh, the BSL-3 facility was used. There's Krasimir getting suited up because uh, uh, COVID, of course, is airborne. He has to have a full breathing apparatus. And the assays that were done, Karen certainly can describe these far better than I can, but there's one, it's a, a plaque assay using infectious virus. Uh, so you have the live, these are Vero uh, cells infected with lar live uh, SARS-CoV-2. And there's also then the replicon uh, assay. And the replicon isn't using infectious virus, but it's giving us a very a virtually identical readout. So we're testing our compounds and we have uh, uh, as, a, as a reference compound remdesivir, which is a one uh, micromolar EC50 in uh, uh, the uh, assays that were done. And uh, long and short, we have many compounds that are one micromolar. We also have some compounds like this one's 38 nanomolar EC50. That's inhibition of the, vi of the uh, protease activity, um, but it's not active in um, the replicon assay. And this simply is because it doesn't get into the virus. The cell permeability is too low. So the cell permeability is critical. Uh, the uh, quite remarkable compound is number 19. So this uh, uh, benzyl oxy compound that has a methylated uracil. And in the assay, it was 80 nanomolar in the uh, infectious virus assay and 175 in the replicon assay. So this became our, our lead compound for preclinical work. You know, unfortunately in our world, we can't, you know, we're not Pfizer, so we can't take 10 compounds and put them all into preclinical studies. Uh, but we did uh, work on 19 and uh, a pharmaceutical company was very interested in 19. They took 19 and did their own uh, cell assay, and they took, came back, and in their cell, it was 50 nanomolars. So they con confirmed everything that we, we had reported. So that compound 19 is a very potent uh, uh, compound in inf infected cells. And Karen's group has been working on the PK. It has very good uh, basic uh, PK bioavailability. And they have done with Pretty Kumar some initial uh, mouse studies, and uh, this is with these humanized mouse, mice, K18, H, ACE2 uh, mice. And again, Karen could describe the current status of this, but basically we were delighted, a very low dose of the compounds that we're using. 
And uh, if you don't, uh, untreated my mouse after six days is, uh, this is now fluorescent imaging of where the virus is. So initially the virus goes into the lungs, but it makes its way into the brain. And at day six, the mouse is again, uh, horribly infected and dies. So we have tested, we meaning uh, Karen and Pretty, uh, by both IV and oral. Um, and the results have been very good. There's only one dose and you see protection for four days, you know, completely clean a mouse. And even at six days uh, with the oral, it's uh, you know, really very clean. So if this was being dosed every day, the feeling is the infection uh, wouldn't uh, go on. So we have very uh, in, you know, encouraging data with this uh, compound. Uh, there has been some, uh, you know, again, external interest in this compound. You know, we think we, if we had the resources, we can come up with lots of other compounds, but uh, we need uh, support for this at a you know, high level because these uh, preclinical studies are, are expensive. Um, so just to compare what we've done versus others. So first of all, our compound is a non-covalent inhibitor. Uh, most of the other work in this area has been on covalent inhibitors. Um, up until recently, covalent inhibitors were considered to be you know, uh, not desirable because you're always worried about off-target uh, activity. But here is how other people progress. So a lot of these things are peptidic. Uh, generally, we don't like peptidic inhibitors because they can be proteolized by many uh, 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 proteolytic enzymes that exist uh, in humans. So, but uh, this is some of the compounds and uh, EC50 of uh, 720, remember we're at 50 or 80 uh, nanomolar. Uh, this is the COVID moonshot that got quite a bit of publicity. This is just the IC50. They uh, obtained an assay, 2,400 compounds, and the best IC50 they obtained was basically 100 nanomolar. Um, at 30, we had made no more than 30 compounds and we were at 18 nanomolar, and another uh, peptide, uh, peptide, peptide. But this is uh, Paxlovid. So Paxlovid is this nermatrelvir, but you have to include a CYP inhibitor, ritonavir. So ritonavir is an HIV protease inhibitor. Uh, not something you probably want to take for a long time. Have there are side effects of that. Of course, you're not going to take Paxlovid for a long time, so I guess it's okay. But on the other hand, uh, having to have the CYP inhibitor uh, to in uh, keep the protease inhibitor from being chewed up uh, metabolically is clearly not desirable because you don't want to be, uh, you know, you can have drug-drug uh, interactions. This is our compound, again, by comparison. Uh, other things that, uh, you know, I'm obviously a little bit prejudiced here, but uh, this to me uh, is a tough molecule. All the stereochemistry is going to be tough to synthesize. You're going to have high cost of goods. It's peptidic. You worry about that. It is a covalent inhibitor. It covalently modifies the cyano, but it's probably reversible or covalent. There have been uh, uh, synthesis issues uh, uh, with the compound. It's also intrinsically not as potent as our compound. It's a, a EC50 of 740, whereas we're at you know, 10 times uh, more potent. When there's no, we don't, we know from our uh, preclinical work on off-target and SIP activity that we don't have any SIP problems with the compound either. So uh, the rest of the story, so why isn't our compound in clinical trials? And that's a, uh, uh, probably takes me more than the last uh, time I, I have here, but uh, the Paxilovid and the Nirmel Trelvir got into clinical trials very quickly because it was sitting on the shelf from the SARS-CoV-1 project. They made a minor modification to make it uh, have better solubility. Uh, so it was ready to go. And so it's off and running. I doubt seriously it's the best drug possible. Uh, there's no way and time will tell, the problem for the pharmaceutical companies is they're all in the business of making money. And so the uh, before uh, at the end of last fall, uh, people were getting kind of cocky about, uh, you know, 
COVID's under control, the vaccines are working, and then Omicron came along uh, around December of uh, uh, last year, and that's changed things a bit. But we'll see who has the you know stamina to advance additional protease inhibitors into the clinic because of the cost of the clinical trials. This is a timeline just showing the power, I think, of our approach. So June 15th, all we had was parenpenal. By August 3rd, we had these uh, six and four micromolar compounds. By September 2nd, we had the propoxy, 140 nanomolar compound. September 10th, we had the corresponding uh, benzyloxyuracil. And uh, then we started getting some crystal structures. October 3rd, we had the first crystal structure. October uh, uh, 4th, uh, also the propoxy compound. And, uh, but the speed here, at which we got to the, uh, uh, these sort of low nanomolar compounds, again, to get to 18 nanomolar, we had synthesized about 30 compounds. And a few of them were things we, uh, probably eight or 10 of them, were real or wild uh, shots. And this synthesis was done by, again, postdoc Chun Wei and graduate student Lizzie. So that's the story. And I, I hope I've told you a little bit about what Karen and I do and uh, the uh, power of combining the computation with the uh, you know, reliable assaying and crystallography is such a different world than what we lived in uh, 20 years ago. So just thanking uh, uh, people in my lab, uh, notably, and Julian is a long-term associate, other, uh, so he's a senior research scientist, Anna and Joe are both associate research scientists and uh, other people uh, listed here. Karen, of course, my wonderful collaborator and other uh, PI collaborators, uh, Pretty uh, Yossi on our Jack projects, and uh, uh, Brett Brett and Farron on the uh, COVID project. So, uh, pleasure to be here with you, and thank you very much. What a whirlwind journey! Yeah, amazing. Um, are there any? Questions here. Emily, are you monitoring questions in the chat? Tommy. Yeah, these, uh, the COVID compounds are all binding to the active site of the uh, proteus. So the cysteine, that's a, there's a cysteine, it's a cysteine protease. There's a cysteine uh, sort of in the middle of all the structures I showed you, and that's the uh, uh, active site cysteine. Uh, yes, the... Uh, uh, the Pfizer compound binds in that same site and it covalently modifies that cysteine. It's not covalent. He's asking if in the in the crystal structure does it bind to the cleavage site? Uh, yes, and the, this is the uh, the cysteine there, cis one forty five, and this histidine over here are the catalytic residues. So our compounds sitting right on top of them, and the the uh, Pfizer compound covalently modifies that cysteine, as do most of the other. There are very few non-covalent inhibitors have been reported for this, but we, from the get-go, we wanted to pursue non-covalent inhibitors just to avoid the potential issues of covalent inhibitors. So, you know, we're, we're extremely familiar with the hypermutability of this virus in the spike protein to evade immunity. 
I wonder if you've done sort of low dose exposure and if there's a mutational uh, response to, to a protease inhibitor like this. Um, yeah, I haven't, maybe, I mean, we haven't to my knowledge, unless Karen's been up to something I don't know about. Um, the SARS-CoV-1 protease and SARS-CoV-2 protease are extremely identical. They're, okay. The only differences are quite far from the, uh, the protease active site. So it's, it's hoped that uh, there won't be uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of uh, mutations possible for the protease. However, it hasn't been under pressure. So I think with the uh, Paxlovid treatments, we will probably begin to see some uh, mutations closer to the binding site. And there, there was a recent paper in uh, Science, I believe, it Science, uh, indicating uh, some uh, mutations that might arise in this protease. So it was under some pressure that they uh, put it. But we haven't looked into that yet. Um, so this is a this is a related question, but how different is the CoV2 protease active site from that of other common human proteases? Um, well, I, I would say it's, it's uh, the COVID active site is quite unique, um, but it's virtually identical to the SARS-CoV-1 uh, active site. But uh, I don't think there's been a, um, I, I don't think that these inhibitors are generally inhibiting other uh, proteases. Uh, <clears throat> So I, I'm, I haven't heard that, uh, so I don't expect it. Uh, if they were, it would certainly be, you'd imagine it'd be a cysteine uh, protease would be the ones you'd be uh, looking at. Well, we're, we're at the hour. I, I can't thank you enough for this lucid explanation to a bunch of non-chemists. Um, it was really beautiful also on behalf of healthcare workers who you know, see people with COVID all the time. It's wonderful work. Thank you very much. Thank you.